welcome everyone to watch uh, SID uh, yes interview today. SID is uh, for Society for Information Display. It's a global association for uh, display industry and the technical uh, community. We, we are the Young Engineer Spotlight uh, uh, program. So we provide a forum uh, where early career engineers can uh, share their first educational experience in the professional world and uh, learn from SID peers and the colleagues at all career levels. And next uh, this display week 2021 will be held in San Jose, uh, California, May 16th to 21st. And during this month, from now to this week, week 2021, we will roll out a series of interview sessions with the senior uh, in industry professionals. And our goal is to showcase the achievement of senior display pro professionals and help young engineers to learn from their successful uh, industry experience, uh, their twists and turns. I'm the main host for the interview session. Um, my name is Li Bo Wen. I'm a staff product engineer in Omnivision, Silicon Valley. Uh, I'm working in AR glass display. We have a co-host uh, today, He Jia Yang. Uh, she is a material scientist with uh, more than three years experience in uh, material formulation for flexible display uh, applications. So we are very glad to have uh, our very first uh, interviewer today. He is uh, uh, famous for the invention of uh, HDR, which is short for high dynamic range display. Uh, this technology is commonly used uh, in consumer display products uh, uh, today. And he started a company from uh, undergraduate start, uh, school and sold the company at a very early stage after three to four years with a significant return for stakeholders. He spawned in uh, Germany and uh, moved to Canada for grad undergraduate study and uh, built a, a successful uh, career in North America. Media uh, technology entrepreneur with a deep experience in uh, the university technology transfer space. And he just retired from uh, president uh, of the SID. So, uh, so the, uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Helga Season to join us for today's uh, interview. Helga. Uh, welcome. welcome. Thank you, Leo. Thank you, KJ. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you here. Uh, so uh, let's uh, start with uh, the, uh, some your early experience. You are born in Germany and uh, moved to Canada for undergraduate study. What's your experience, uh, growth experience in Germany, and? Uh, why you moved to Canada for undergraduate study, and uh, why you pick up a major which is physics, which is uh, very difficult uh, for most people. Can you share some experience on your experience uh, in Germany? Yeah, and certainly, certainly, happy to share my, my early journey. Um, and it's gonna sound a lot less rational uh, than uh, I think a lot of people's lives plan. So I, uh, as you just mentioned, I, I grew up in Germany in, um, uh, in, a, in a very, very loving home, but not one that really was oriented towards uh, technology or entrepreneurship or, or really any of the things that I do today, uh, right? Instead, um, uh, my, my parents were very supportive of what I was gonna do, but really had no notion of what I should be doing. Um, and so uh, the idea had formed in my kind of late teenage years to study in an English speaking country uh, principally because I didn't speak English. So I actually had French as my first foreign language in, um, uh, in, in school, in, in high school. Um, and English came pretty late and I had a you know, sort of very rudimentary understanding of the language. And I thought uh, that you know, studying in an English speaking country would give me the ability to communicate in English, uh, which seemed like a good thing to have in the, in the, well, back then 20th century, but certainly in the coming 21st century. Um, uh, these days, I might might have gone to China to study there, since uh, <laughs> that's becoming more and more important. But at the time, English was clearly going, you know, sort of the, the dominant international language. Um, and so, I wanted to study in an English-speaking country. I um, uh, honestly, physics I picked because I had good grades in in high school in physics. Right? If I had, if I had good grades in other subjects, I would have would have would have picked some other subject. But and because at the time, 
I had no idea what it means to do a physics degree. Uh, and, and nobody in my family had any degree either. So my, my parents, uh, nobody in my family has ever gone to university. Nobody in my family has, has completed, you know, gone to high school. Um, and so we, we didn't really have a kind of, there was like no strong pre-selection. I just went good, good grades in high school physics. That seems like the thing to study. And then I actually remember my dad uh, told me, you know, why don't we just find out what, what physicists actually do and, and what, where they study because we have no clue. And so we wrote these letters. This is this, uh, I, 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 email was around at the time, but I didn't have email. So we wrote letters uh, to a few places asking them, you know, what, what does a physicist do and where would you recommend, you know, I study and what kind of degree do you think I should get? Uh, and that's, that was my first introduction to really bad survey research because uh, I, didn't, I didn't know what physicists do and so, of course, I didn't know where physicists worked either. So the only people I wrote letters to were in, in entities that were, had the word physics in the name of the entity, right? So there would be like a, a, a company, of course, no company has, you work at Omnivision, you don't work at Omnivision Physics Inc., right? So, so the only places that had the word physics in the title of the company were theoretical physics research groups, basically like laser physics or something, theoretical groups. So I ended up um, I, I ended up sending letters and a few of them replied and said, yeah, you know, we recommend you, you know, you study at these universities or that universities. And, uh, and some, some of them recommended uh, the University of British Columbia up in, in Vancouver, Canada, which is, which is where I then applied, where I got accepted and where I went. Uh, when I arrived at UBC, I, I realized very quickly that the only reason why they had recommended UBC is that UBC has um, something called Triumph, which is a particle accelerator. So they have a cyclotron on campus, like, like, like CERN in Switzerland. Um, and so because of that, UBC was somewhat famous among the very narrow group of particle physics researchers who I had sent, email, who I had sent letters to, right? Other than that, it's just a normal physics department like any other. Um, and of course, other than getting a tour for about you know, 15 minutes in the, in the accelerator, uh, I never ever had anything to do whatsoever with particle physics. So, so my whole sort of choice of, you know, early career university selection uh, turned out to be essentially random. Uh, but, um, but that's how I ended up at, uh, at UBC, uh, studied uh, physics. Um, and um, right, right away, basically, right in the, right in the first few weeks, uh, realized that I was going to be up against a really high hurdle. So my my English language skills were really, really bad, so bad that I failed every single test. Like they have these various tests at the beginning that you have to take uh, to, to go, you know. And, and so they told me I had to go back to high school. They told me I was not good enough to take physics classes. Um, I, I didn't go back to high school, but I was, I was pretty depressed at the time. It was obvious that I was going to be, it's going to be an uphill struggle for me. Um, and uh, so I was uh, going around campus basically trying to find friendly people because everybody, everybody had basically told me I'm an idiot, basically. They, they were polite about it, but they were basically telling me I'm, I'm just not capable, right? Um, go back to high school, you know, don't go into honors physics, uh, go, you know, study something else, go take English classes. Um, and uh, two people uh, uh, really helped me out. So the, uh, the Dean of Science at that time, Maria Clave, uh, who uh, is now the president of Harvey Mutt uh, University, um, she, uh, I, I encountered her in, a, in sort of a welcoming event for international students and um, she, uh, uh, we, we got to talking and I sort of shared my, my issues and said, well, you know, uh, I, I, I know, a, I have a colleague who's a physics professor, he might be able to help you. And she connected me to uh, Lauren Whitehead, uh, who was an associate dean at the time, who was a professor in physics. Uh, and, you know, who I interacted with and I helped him a bit on some administrative stuff, really just volunteer work. And after that volunteer work, he basically said, hey, it was really fun working with you. Why don't you, you know, work in my lab? Um, and I started working uh, as basically a helper. I mean, I, I was a first year physics student entering second year. I didn't have, I didn't have any special skills, right? I, I didn't know anything. So I started working in his lab as a, as a helper. Um, doing all sorts of stuff, setting up the computers and, you know, installing Windows 
2000, I guess it would have been at that time, right? And, uh, and so forth. And, uh, uh, but slowly started uh, working on sort of a project work, including on the early project work that would lead to uh, the creation of, of my first startup and, uh, and the HDR display uh, technology. Is there any uh, scholarship or financial aid from? <laughs> no, I wish. It was so expensive. So, um, and everybody thought it was crazy because in Germany, uh, education is free or pretty close to free, right? And so I had this option of studying in Germany where it would have been essentially free. Uh, and I went instead to Canada where it was like $20,000 of tuition a year. And I didn't have $20,000. So I was, I was completely broke. I had arrived, I'd, uh, I'd done military service in, in Germany, uh, which was, was, was mandatory still at the time. Uh, so I had a bit of money saved up from there and my parents had a little bit of money, but nowhere near to cover you know, what I needed. Um, and so I was completely broke um, and um, uh, had to, like they kicked me out of student residence because I couldn't pay for the, for the student residence plan. I had to, uh, I lived in, a, in like a shared house with four rooms and six people and two of them were hookers. I'm not sure if I can say that on the record, but um, <laughs> the, 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 yeah, so it, it was a fairly um, uh, exotic lifestyle at the time, um, uh, trying to save money everywhere. Uh, and then, you know, the, we, we started the startup and we did some work. And in fact, I ended up to some extent, to some extent, I worked in the startup area because it interests me and I was, we were commercializing a technology that I was very passionate about. But to some extent, it was also because I had no alternatives. Because as an international student in Canada, you can't work. You, you don't have a work permit, so you can't work in normal jobs, right? If maybe if, um, if I could have just worked at Burger King, right, and made... 10 bucks an hour and, and maybe I wouldn't be an entrepreneur today but but uh, the reality is the only thing I could do is work on university on campus uh, research project and then those turned into a startup and it went from there. Mm. Yeah the things always have a bad side and a good side. <laughs> so Absolutely yeah no no it's always a, there's always a silver lining. Ironically so in my undergrad when I had no money was broke and there was no scholarship. Um, then I sold uh, my company and obviously now was financially in a much better position. Uh, and suddenly I got a scholarship for my PhD and everything was paid for. And it was just so ridiculous because it was not, no, at, all, not at all needed anymore. Uh, so yeah, I, uh, these days I actually privately uh, fund a number of scholarships for uh, undergrad students just to uh, because I, 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 I think people would be better off if they have a bit of support early when it matters, not late when it's, you know, we, we're pretty much done with the journey. Yeah, it was, a, it was definitely an interesting experience, but it also, you know, it, it, it taught me, as, as all experiences, it teaches you something about life, it influences mm -hmm. your choices, right? Perseverance, gets stronger, you know, obstacles are things that you can overcome. So, I, I don't regret any of it, but it, um, it certainly could have been financially easier. Let's put it that way. Uh, let's talk about your uh, bachelor of studies. So uh, how is your advisor? And uh, uh, it looks like uh, you, in, you, are, you were involved uh, with uh, research uh, very early. And uh, how is your advisor and professor? Uh, so, so my academic journey is um, is highly unconventional and, and therefore difficult uh, to sort of transpose into the experience of others. Um, it doesn't mean that the, you know there, there, are, there are others that have had similarly unconventional journeys. Um, but I think for most people, uh, my experience is a bit weird. Um, and and the, the dominant reason for that is that I got involved in building and founding the startup uh, right early on. Right, because that what what happens is typically for for the vast majority of people, um, the 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 sort of central priority during their early early journey is their academic track. Right, so there are principally undergrad students, and then there are principally master students, and then principally if, if they get one PhD students. And yes, they might be doing some other stuff. Right, they might work a little bit in parallel. They might you know do other things. They're, they're, that's really their principal track. For me, um, right about my second year undergrad, second entering third year, 
uh, that transition was complete where my principal activity was the company we're building and everything else sort of happened on the side as a, as a side activity. So uh, like for my undergrad, for example, there were entire months long periods where I wasn't even in Vancouver, where I was somewhere else, where I was working somewhere else, right? Uh, I spent uh, eight months in Montreal actually at the time, a few months in Toronto, uh, and, and all this was driven by the needs of the business, finding collaborators, working in different sites to build, build a bigger team. Uh, and that only got worse. So by my, uh, by my, by, my, my graduate studies, master's turning into a PhD, uh, I was rarely on campus at all. I was constantly building the commercial business. Uh, my research uh, uh, became entirely around the work that we're doing in the company my collaborators, my supervisors, like all, all that stuff was anchored around the, the business and just in an academic framework. So I, uh, uh, I, I, I had supervisors that were very supportive of that, uh, that were, you know, um, because you couldn't, there, there was no possible way to do what I did without that, that kind of support from both the supervisors and from the university. Uh, they created, for example, for my, for my grad school, uh, I was in the in individual interdisciplinary graduate student program, which is a custom program that UBC set up to basically allow me to make my degree while building a company. Um, and, and so that's it's a huge amount of support. And I will always be very grateful to both UBC, the institution and to the, the professors. Um, uh, but it also meant that nothing was conventional, right? Everything was sort of like I, um, and, and it, in the work in the company moved much faster than the academic schedule. Uh, so for example, when I started my master's, I had already published probably a dozen journal papers or so because the company was moving much faster. So um, the whole master's thing where you're supposed to write one or two papers and then you know put them in the thesis was basically done before I started, right? And so it, there was a lot of other weird things like that, like in my, by the time I was defending my PhD, I had uh, a set up donated uh, two uh, professorships at UBC that two of my supervisors were holding, right? So this, like, the, the dynamics are all mixed up, uh, like, uh, in terms of the, everything, everything is sort of messy. Uh, it worked out extremely well for me, uh, but as I said earlier, it's a, it's a hard one for me to make recommendations from for kind of uh, regular journeys to undergrad or grad school because it's so not not representative of the normal journey. It was a lot of fun though. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I believe there are uh, many uh, research topics uh, for you to choose in undergraduate study. So, uh, and you choose the uh, electronic uh, display area. And uh, is there any reason for this? Or is it just uh, happened to be here? Yeah, yeah, again, it was really entirely driven by that startup effort. So, you know, I like the choice of physics was because of grades in high school. Once I ended up there, so at UBC, the first year in science is just general science. You take a class of physics and chemistry and biology, whatever. Um, and it's only by the second year that you actually specialize into, well, specialize at an undergrad level. You pick physics over chemistry or something. Um, and um, by that point, right in that second year, I was already working in Lauren Whitehead, Whitehead's lab and we were starting to work on that, what would become the HDR concept. So, um, so right from that start, everything I did academically wasn't uh, kind of a choice of the program. It was basically, what do I need to know to build the technology that we are building a company around? So I went, uh, you know, we, I, I started working on optical physics concepts during my undergrad because not because I wanted to know about optical physics. I mean, obviously I was interested in it, but mainly because we were trying to figure out how to put LEDs behind an LCD and that's an optics problem, right? And then we had, when we had figured that out, the next thing we were trying to figure out is how to uh, do the software. The, the, the HDR display was really one of the first uh, computational displays, like a display where computation was a key part of generating the, the image. Right, so it wasn't just like a display where you plugged in a RGB signal and then it popped up. You had to actually compute something a bit like AR solutions now, but back then th that wasn't the case, right? Back then LCDs were basically boxes that you shoved in the signal and then it showed up, right? And so 
Um, so we had to understand about software. So I went into computer science doing my master's. Uh, and then, you know, we had to put that software into semiconductors. And so, you know, I had to go into electrical engineering to learn about FPGAs and ultimately about ASIC design. Uh, and so I, I, like my degrees kind of followed uh, whatever I needed to figure out for the, for the for the technology and for the business that we were commercializing, um, rather than kind of me picking a topic, it was uh, it was backwards. A PhD at study, you pick choose the four different uh, areas: uh, physics, uh, computer science, electrical engineer, and uh, it's now a psychology. So these four areas for your PhD study. Exactly, and, and psychology, I mean, nobody should ever ask me for counseling or something like that. Like, the, the reason why I ended up in psychology is because at UBC, cognitive neuroscience was basically in, in the psychology department. So I was even there, uh, we were thinking, we we're looking at uh, visual system, uh, how do you perceive colors? How do you perceive brightness? Things like that, because again, we had built a display that for the first time could show a dynamic range that would actually challenge the, the visual apparatus, right? Bef you know, because the normal dynamic range of a normal screen just isn't high enough to really trigger a lot of the higher level visual functions. Uh, and our display was, so I had to understand that too. Um, and uh, so all of that is driven by, I even did, uh, it's not listed on my CV, but I even did uh, uh, most of an MBA during that period. Um, and that was again, because I was building a business and wanted to understand how to build a business. So everything was sort of picked by uh, the necessity of my, uh, of my mission.